Um, hi, my name is Shenna, and today I'm going to be talking to you about Learning to Boost, which is a logistic regression model to optimize Elasticsearch boosts. And I would like to introduce my colleague, Nina Shu. Hi, I'm Nina. Great, let's get started. So first of all, we would like to tell you a little bit about what Guru is to contextualize how we work on search. So Guru is a company wiki that works in your workflow. And with Guru, you can asynchronously share product information, onboard employees, and streamline internal communications. You might recognize the logos of some of our customers on this slide. Um, Guru has a web app, a Chrome extension, a Slack bot, and a mobile app. So we're really focused on bringing you the information you need to do your job where you're already working. One key feature of Guru is verification. So anytime you are reading a piece of information in Guru, you will know whether or not to trust it based on its verification status, which indicates the last time it was verified by an expert at your company. And so a little bit more about who we are. Nina and I are both on the search and discovery team at Guru. This is our team and everything that we are talking about today, everyone on this slide has contributed to. And so we wanted to acknowledge that and thank all of them for their contributions. So a little bit more about the search application at Guru. Um, our customers are searching for information that is contained in documents that we call cards in their own Guru instance. So for example, on this slide, someone is searching in Guru, what holidays do I get? And then they're seeing this internal company document called company holidays. This is a B2B use case. And so the information our customers are storing in Guru is particular to each customer. And we are using Elasticsearch. So to be more specific about the information landscape at Guru, Guru is used by thousands of companies from a variety of industries. Each one of those companies is creating and maintaining their own documents in Guru with company specific jargon. And so the important point here is that our customers are the subject matter experts for the knowledge that they are storing in Guru and not us. So we have large companies using Guru with over 10,000 documents who might be doing over 5,000 searches per day. We also have mid-sized companies who might have around 100 documents and are only doing a few queries per day. So um, there are a variety of companies using Guru for a variety of domains. So here's an outline of how we will talk about learning to boost. We'll start with a problem statement. So what problem are we trying to solve? Then we will present our approach we will talk about the results that we have seen, and we will also touch on some special considerations for using Learning to Boost. So what problem are we solving? So here on the left, you can see quite a simple Elasticsearch query. We are using the movie database, and in this example, we are searching, or we're trying to match on the title and the overview and our query is Rocky. And in this example, the title has a boost of one and the overview has a boost of 0.5. So many of you may already recognize that in production, things can get quite a bit more complex. So here's another example of uh, an Elasticsearch query. But for this one, we've added quite a few analyzed fields that we would like to consider uh, matching against. And so as you add analyzed fields for each document, maybe you also want to have a specific boost for each one of those fields. And this leads to a problem where you have many different field boosts to tune. 
So let's review some of the options available to us for how to choose Elasticsearch boost values. First, we have manual tuning. So here I'm calling out Cupid because one thing that you could do would be to um, expose your algorithm via Cupid and have some users rate some searches in Cupid, and then you can calculate a search metric based on those users' ratings and tweak things to try to um, make the document score higher. And so an advantage here is that it's easy. And another advantage is that it's guided by search metrics. But some limitations are that this requires you to gather these explicit relevance judgments. And the people who are giving those judgments must have some domain expertise about what they're rating. And it can be hard to extend this to a multi-tenant use case. There's also grid search. So here I have called out an Elastic blog post from three years ago, where they're talking about the ranking evaluation API. And you get to the end of the blog post and they basically say, if after you've evaluated your query using the ranking evaluation API, the quality has increased, you're done. <laughs> Otherwise, try something else. And so the advantages to an approach like this are that it's more thorough than try it and see. But then the limitation is there can be permutation explosion as you try to test more and more things. So then there's genetic algorithms, which were mentioned by Trey. So this is a, a Haystack talk called Evolving Relevance by Tim Allison. And it's about the library Quarita, which lets you use genetic algorithms and random search to find optimal parameters for relevance ranking. I would recommend this talk. Um, some advantages here, it is data-driven and you can test many parameters besides just the boost values. There's also no linearity constraint, which we will get to later. But a limitation here could be that it may not scale well with complexity. And then, of course, we have learning to rank. Um, an advantage is that it's data driven. But then some limitations are there's a high data need. There can be a high barrier to entry to implementing it. And it's commonly done at a re-ranking step due to the high computation demand that it presents. So now I will turn it over to Nina to talk more about learning to boost and how it works. All right, um, so this is learning to boost. Learning to boost or LTV is a logistic regression model that uses relevance judgments to determine the optimal Elasticsearch boost values for an Elasticsearch query. Uh, so if you're familiar with learning to rank a little bit, this definition seems uh, similar. Both approaches are trying, the end goal of both approaches are trying to provide uh, optimal ranked lists of search results returned from Elasticsearch. I would call out here specifically for learning to boost the output, final output for uh, the approach are the boost values that can be plugged into Elasticsearch uh, and the query in turn will return us hopefully the optimal ranked list of results. Um, to entice you to follow us uh, with on the uh, method, um, this is why you should care. It is also a very data-driven approach. Uh, it's relatively easy to train. It's just a simple logistic regression model. And uh, learning to boost is very easy to productionize. Uh, and it is also automated for future iterations. Once uh, the method is, is implemented one time, it's very easy to rerun over and over again. Um, all right, so the first piece of how it works is um, the data we need to feed into a learning to boost model. Uh, this also, again, looks quite similar to what you would need for learning to rank. Um, so from a query, there would be a list of documents to choose from. Uh, here, we're continued uh, to using the movie database example. And each document will have scores for each of the fields it's matched on. For example, the title score, overview score, these are typically BM25 scores. 
Uh, of course, I'm using the dot, dot, dot here to remind us that usually there are more than two fields to consider, uh, which is why this is a complex problem. So aside from the document BM25 scores, uh, each document needs a relevance judgment label. Uh, the previous two talks have set us up really well with explicit judgment and implicit judgment. So um, provide judgment label however you will, uh, whichever fits you the best. In our case, we're using a binary label and they are implicit judgments based on click data. So um, in a simplified way, a document, if it's been clicked on by the user, then it's considered relevant. Uh, so in this made up example, document two is the only relevant document from this query. And then with that data, so let's review how Elasticsearch does the scoring and ranking, and then I'll tie that into logistic regression. Um, okay, so here again is the list of documents from the query. Uh, a common way of scoring in Elasticsearch is each field is multi each field score is multiplied by its own corresponding boost value and then added together to get a total final score for the document. And then the documents are ranked um, by the total score from highest to lowest. I say this is a common scoring mechanism because uh, I, we are only focusing on this kind of scoring mechanism with learning to boost. So if so, as you can see, if with a hypothetical title boost of one and overview boost of 0.5, document two is ranked second overall in the whole list. And we remember if that was the only relevant document, this is not quite the ideal situation we want to be in. So the goal of using learning to boost is to find the optimal boost. For example, if now we just like learn to boost decides that the overview boost should be 0.1. And then after the multiplying and the adding, document number two ends up with the highest total score and ranks top on the list, then this would be uh, an ideal situation we're trying to achieve with learning to boost. So with that problem, how does that tie into logistic regression? Now let's rewrite the Elasticsearch score mechanism into a simple formula. So on the left side of the screen, we're seeing again for Elasticsearch, we take the BM25 scores of each of the fields, multiply them by their corresponding boost value, add them together, get the total score. And then on the right side of the screen, I'm showing you a simple logistic regression formula. And I'll talk, I'll talk about that and then I'll show you how these two formulas basically mirror each other. Um, for those who are not familiar, logistic regression takes a set of feature values and it tries to find the best coefficients so that the linear combination of the feature values is best at predicting a binary, binary label. Um, to dig into the formula, formula a little bit, uh, the x1 and x2 represent the feature values and betas represent the coefficients and L is the loss we're calculating here. And it is a function of the probability that a binary label is one. By minimizing the loss, uh, uh, basically, we, um, basically the model is best at predicting correctly the binary label. So now that you can see uh, these two formulas are color coded and basically how it works with Elasticsearch is if we take the BM25 scores as the feature values in logistic regression and we estimate the coefficients beta and then the coefficients will serve as boost values which we can plug back into Elasticsearch to give us um, ranked lists. So uh, yeah, this, this uh, slide is basically, I would say the first half of the magic on, uh, uh, on how regression could give us 
boost values for Elasticsearch. Now I will pass it back to Jenna to talk about the implementation steps. Great, so to talk about our implementation in a little bit more detail, there are five steps and those steps are collect data, featureize, train, evaluate, and deploy. And we will go through each one of them. So starting with the collect data step, I have written here, replay past searches with all boosts set to one, record explanations for each result. So the first thing we should talk about is how do we replay past searches? At Guru, we use a homegrown framework called offline search trials to replay millions of past searches using uh, whatever algorithm we would like to test in an environment that is completely isolated from production. We then compare the results of the replayed searches to the results that we saw in production. So for learning to boost, an initial search trial using an Elasticsearch query with boost set to one will provide us with the training data in the form of search explanations and scores. So let's talk about that more concretely. So here we have our same example of a very simple Elasticsearch query against the movie database. So in constructing our training set, we will first set the boost to one. And then uh, on the next slide, I'm just calling out what a search explanation looks like. So you have to keep in mind that we are replaying millions of queries and we're recording the explanation for each result for each one of those queries. So this is just one example of an explanation of a search result for one query, which if you remember, it is Rocky. And so this explanation is actually for the movie Rocky. It's pretty simple because there's a match on both the title and the overview. Again, if you are at all familiar with Elasticsearch explanations, you will recognize how simplified this example is. But um, so essentially, once we have gathered all of these explanations, we're now ready to featureize. And the way we do that is by transforming the scores and explanations from the trial into the feature values. So how do we do that? So we start with the search explanation that I had just shown. It's just collapsed a little bit. And we have some parsing logic that takes in search explanations and gives us how much each analyzed field that we're considering is contributing to the total score for that document. So in this case, again, there's a title match, there's an overview match. Both of them are contributing some amount to the, the elastic search score for that document. And so we can put that into our data frame of training examples for this particular search for that particular document. And we can also add the label according to the implicit judgment that Nina had mentioned. I did want to mention there is a normalization step here because Elasticsearch scores are not comparable across queries. But just um, for simplicity, what you need to take away here is that we are just trying to store how much each analyzed field is contributing to the final score. And now I will pass it back to Nina to talk about training the model. All right, um, now that we have the training data ready, it's time to fit a logistic regression model. Uh, for the logistic regression model, we're taking a pairwise approach. I'll talk about what that is in a little bit, but first, why? As Jenna mentioned, elastic search scores are not comparable across queries. So you could have one query you just saw whose scores could be 293 on that scale, and another query could uh, like very easily give you scores that are on a totally different scale. So for one query, maybe a total score of nine, say would correspond to a relevant result. It would not be the case for another query. So this is the problem we're trying to solve with the pairwise approach. 
And the pairwise approach for learning to boost is inspired by pairwise learning to rank. Um, it has the same basic ideas, but different implementation. Uh, first, this is a review of pointwise learning to rank versus pairwise learning to rank. For pointwise learning to rank approaches, uh, the model would take each document and try to predict the probability that that document is relevant. On the other hand, for pairwise learning to rank, uh, the model would take a pair of documents from the query result list and predict the probability that the first document is more relevant than the second document. So we would do that same idea, uh, but there is a trick uh, uh, for learning to boost here. So pairwise learning to rank would require a totally different loss function compared to pointwise learning to rank. It would be a totally different machine learning model, but we're still, for learning to boost, we're still just trying to use logistic regression. So the trick here is that we are making the data into a pairwise format. So there are two things. Uh, first, we will take the diff difference of the feature values for each pair of documents from the same query. And then uh, for we would create new labels for each document pair based on comparison of relevance. So this is an illustration of how it works. Um, Let's just take the first three documents from a query, for example. Uh, we would be calculating score differences, making, we would be making pairs, calculating score differences, and generating comparison labels. So uh, for document pair one versus two, here are the score differences. And for the comparison label, again, it's a binary label. So we're calling the label zero if the if the first document is less relevant and a comparison label of one would mean the first document is more relevant. Okay, so one versus two, because document one is not relevant, document two is relevant. By comparison, the comparison label is zero. And for a document pair one versus three, because both documents are not relevant, we will leave this pair out of the comparison. And uh, for documents two versus three, here are the score differences. And because doc two is relevant, doc three is not relevant, the comparison label is one. Uh, so by this reformatting, what we're doing here is that we are taking the comparison from across rows of the data set to within each row. So each row in itself is already a comparison of relevance. And because we make sure that each row only has documents that only come from the same query. So we make sure that the majority of the comparison only happens within the same query to account for the issue that uh, scores across queries, different queries are, are not comparable. So yes, that's how to uh, create the pairwise data format. And then in this, uh, in th on this slide, I would like to further uh, give a little bit of a quick theoretical uh, justification on why logistic regression performed on pairwise data is still able to give us the boost values that we can use in Elasticsearch. So suppose we have two documents, I and J, in the, um, these top two formula indicate the way the scores are calculated for these documents in a pointwise fashion. And if we take the difference of the two equations on both sides of the equation, uh, this, long, this third formula would give us the way scores are calculated in the pairwise fashion. Um, so specifically, x sub 1i minus x sub 1j would be the score difference of the first field, for example, the title field, and x2i minus x2j would be the score difference of the uh, overview field. What I want to call out here is that with both of these arrangements, the coefficients beta remain the same. So that means 
we can use the coefficient from the pairwise approach the same way as the pointwise approach and plug them in to Elasticsearch as boost values. So this is, I would say, completes the second half of magic, why we can use logistic regression uh, to obtain Elasticsearch boosts. So that was, um, that was the um, arranged, uh, arra after the data is arranged in a pairwise format, it's time to fit the logistic regression model. Uh, this is straightforward because there are packages there to make it happen. Uh, if you use Spark, uh, we use Spark, so we used PySpark.ml. Uh, Scikit-Learn is also a popular Python package uh, to fit, uh, which can fit logistic regression model. A quick call out is for this specific application, make sure to restrict the coefficients to non-negative values because Elasticsearch boosts cannot be negative. And then the model is fit, it's time to evaluate the model. We evaluate the model by eventually run a search trial that replaces past searches using the boost values we just learned from the regression model. This is an illustration of the process of evaluating and iterating on the model. We mentioned, we already talked about the first part, the training part. Uh, we take a training set and fit the logistic regression model. Here we have a, a relatively huge uh, sample size for logistic regression because we used imp uh, uh, implicit judgment and we were able to get a lot of data points. But to fit logistic regression model, you generally don't need that big of a sample size. And then after the data is, um, model is fit, we take a development set and calculate some regression metrics and compare the metrics to a baseline. Uh, the some metrics we used are false positive or false negative rates and area under the ROC curve. Uh, if these metrics prove to be satisfactory, we move on to a test set and run the offline search trial we mentioned earlier. Uh, from this search trial, we calculate ranking metrics and compare that to baseline. Uh, some ranking metrics to consider are mean average precision at K, NDCG at K, et cetera. Uh, so uh, you might need to iterate on the model a few times some of the things we did uh, during the iteration is uh, using regularization parameters in logistic regression that addresses a potential multicollinearity multi issues, which means some of your features could be correlated with each other. Uh, it could also do perform feature selection if you have many options of analyzed features, analyzed fields, uh, um, and you're not sure which one to include in the query. Uh, another thing as briefly mentioned by Jenna is that we did normalize the feature scores by query prior to making the pairwise data. So we did the normalization by using the normalization factor, which is the maximum feature score for each query so that the scores are already more comparable across queries to begin with. So that was essentially um, all the implementation steps um, from, now I, I, I forgot the most important step, the deployment. <laughs> uh, if you like, once you have identified a set of boost values that satisfactory, it's time to deploy them into production. And that is so easy because if you already have your search set up, all you need to do is to change the boost values. Um, and that's really, really just really simple. This is the, all the steps from beginning to end to implement uh, learning to boost. But you can do this many times if you know, we need to add a new field, make changes to the query. All we need to do is to recollect data with the new field added and run this process again. And it's gonna be pretty fast because all the code, you know, all the code has been written. Um, it's an established process. Uh, so here are the results we've seen. 
we have a baseline that that which was hand tuned and yes if you've done this you know how long that might take and with the learning to boost model we achieved a 1.6% increase in AUC and a 1.2% increase in math at 5 this may not look like a huge percentage but given the sheer volume of queries we see actually the number of queries that benefit from this improvement is uh, very considerable okay i will pass it to back to jenna to finish up great so finally we have some special considerations that you may wish to keep in mind for learning to boost so some of the prerequisites for us First of all, we have event tracking that enabled us to obtain the implicit judgments that we used. And so this was touched on by Trey, the fact that having a robust event tracking setup will then allow you to later use the implicit data from your users. So we had that in place, which was an important stepping stone on the way to developing this model. And of course, our homegrown offline search trial framework allowed us to obtain the training data. And then once we have trained a model and we have our new boost values, it allowed us to replay searches to evaluate how well those new boost values were doing before we push anything to production. And it also allows us to calculate the search metrics for the replayed searches. So as I had mentioned a while back, there is a linearity constraint here. So the regression approach is useful for queries where your field scores are being summed together. So perhaps you are trying to search for tires and you wanna to add together three different clauses. That could be one case where this approach might work for you. Or if you have some um, more granular clauses where you're doing things that are not additive to the score, you might be able to still use learning to boost for the top level clause boost values, if that makes sense. And so the re given this linearity constraint, the regression approach will not be useful for when you're breaking that constraint. So if you have a script score portion of the query that's um, not additive, that could prevent you from using this approach. However, if your script score is being added to other parts of the query, you may still be able to use learning to boost. Um, but also, this won't be useful for multi-match queries with the best fields type or dismax queries with tiebreaker, anything that is breaking that linearity constraint. There are also labeling considerations. So we've now talked quite a bit today about implicit and explicit judgments. Both of them will work, as Nina had said, but um, the implicit judgment might allow for a bigger sample size and be more suitable for an enterprise use case, whereas explicit judgments could be less prone to the position bias that you would see with implicit judgments. There's also the consideration of binary versus graded relevance. We are using logistic regression with binary labels, but if you have graded labels, you could use ordinal regression. So finally, and this is a very important point, um, let's talk about the loss function in logistic regression versus our search metric. So with this approach, we are not directly optimizing our search metric. So the, the cross entropy loss um, is not taking into account the position of documents. Whereas in search with ranking metrics, you're usually considering the position of the documents. Um, and so even though there is this disconnect, we have seen that the logistic regression metrics and the ranking metrics generally agree until the area under the curve is getting very close to one. 
Also important to note that learning to boost is not intended to replace learning to rank. It's meant as just another complementary tool in your toolbox of how to improve relevance. So that is all that we had for you today. We wanted to share some of the resources that we talked about in this presentation with you, as well as some information about Search at Guru and Guru itself. So if you scan this QR code, that will take you actually directly to a Guru card in the Guru product that has all kinds of information, as well as our contact info. So if you try out Learning to Boost, please do let us know how it goes. And of course, we are hiring. So if you visit getguru.com slash careers, you will see all of our open positions, some of which are called out here, including senior search engineer, senior machine learning engineer. And um, we're based, you can be based in Philadelphia, in San Francisco, or remote. We are a values-driven company. You can see some of our values here on the slide. And I've worked at Guru for almost three years now, and it's a great time. So do consider applying. And with that, we thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nina and Jenna. Um, so we already have some, uh, we have some uh, questions in the chat. So I'm going to start at the top here. Uh, so Dimitri asks, uh, firstly, thanks you for calling out Cupid. Um, and uh, he asks, what the, the, can you explain the split between the size of your training, development and test sets? They appear to be different sizes. Uh, train 700K, Dev 80K plus and test 1, 1 million. Yeah, so uh, the maybe so it doesn't look like a conventional split. Uh, according to, we went by the guideline by Andrew Ng, where uh, basically for the dev set and test set uh, for a large data set, uh, it would be good if they have 10K, at least 10K data points. Um, but for the test set, this is a special case because we use the test set to run the offline search trial and we have uh, many, many tenants. So the trial includes like thousands of teams. Uh, that's why typically for our search trial, we have a huge test set. Uh, um, but yeah, this is just because of, of a unique setup that we have. Okay. Jenna. Yeah, please, uh, Jenna, please add if you have comments. I don't have anything to add. Okay. So uh, Roman asks, are the train boosts computed for each tenant? Or are they shared across the whole platform? So this is a good point that this approach could theoretically de be deployed on a per tenant basis. Um, so you could really do it either way, or you could even cluster tenants together. For example, if you've observed that they exhibit some shared behavior, maybe you want one model per cluster, or maybe you do want one model per tenant, or you can also have one shared model. Um, I think it really depends on your use case and what you're looking to achieve. Yeah, I forgot to mention with logistic re regression because it's such a simple machine learning approach. Once you have the data, it just takes a few seconds to run the model. So it's really not that big of a deal if you want one unique model for each tenant, as long as there's enough, like, you know, decent amount of data. Fantastic. And I'm just wondering if we have any questions from the room. I see Eric's uh, Eric's there, but uh, do we have anyone from the rooms with a question? Seems not. Okay. Um, what about uh, this, this question from Chris Vital? Um, he, he does uh, appreciates the detail. Do you find results change in any material way after shifting from training data to full production data? Uh, I can give it a try. I think I think there's uh, all of this what we show uh, are take are in the offline search trial framework, which means they are not uh, based on action. Like um, how would I say it? They are not um, the actions we're using to provide the relevance judgments are not based on 
user action where they are seeing the search results live. So any kind of offline prototyping always are subject to the position, position bias when the user were clicking on the data. So absolutely, if they're so, um, this does not eat the good offline result does not exempt the need to do a test online to test it out in front of a live user. So it's still absolutely necessary. If you have a B testing framework, if you have any kind of online testing framework do it, make sure uh, the improvement still holds. Yeah, and I would just highlight that this approach allows us to do a lot of experimentation before it gets into our users' hands. And so by the time that we do go to an online trial, we are um, relatively confident that we will see positive results. Um, whereas if you were to try to tune your boost in kind of an A-B testing setup, it's like you don't want to put things in front of your users um, in one of the test groups if it's not working well. So this gives us some, some added security there. That's a great point. Thank you, Jenna. Fantastic. Well, that's all the questions we have from the from the, the oh, hang on. No, one has just snuck in. Well done, Simon. Simon Hughes asks, how do you pick the pairs for the pairs wide training? For any set of ranked documents, the number of pairs is quadratic in the number of documents. So picking the right ones to train on is tricky. Yeah, I think we got away. There are a few tricks we did and we got away with the easy thing. Uh, we didn't get into it uh, for each uh, query. For each query, uh, a simplified approach we started with is to designate designate one document to be the most relevant. So in that case, if you only consider a pair where one is relevant, the other is not, then it's not. Uh, then uh, it really the scale is still just the number of documents. Uh, but that's not the only way to do it. The other trick we did is if um, we, we threw out all the pairs where their relevance is the same. Uh, so only compare, yeah, like I said, only compare the pairs where they have different relevance numbers. Um, but that's a good point. Like it would not extend very well to if you have a hugely, like if you have a great graded relevance of 10, um, that may not be very, um, very practical. Fantastic. Thank you. OK, we'll move on now. So thank you both both very much, Nina and Jenna. Uh, that's been fascinating and we uh, we very much appreciate your contribution.